morning, church family. It's uh, great to be with you again as we worship online and remember the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. As we gather this morning, I want to start with the words from Psalm 34, as the psalmist uh, writes, and this is in verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those, to look, those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in God. And we gather here this morning to remember that God is the one who calls us to take refuge in him. That God is not distant, but God is involved and engaged in our lives. And we come to this table this morning to be reminded that as we taste, we see that the Lord is good. As we remind ourselves of the body of Jesus that was broken, of the blood that was shed, it allows us to have life and have abundant and everlasting life. And so we gather with that sense of hope and expectation. And as we gather, I invite you to join with me in prayer. Well, God, thank you that you are with us. Thank you, Lord, that in the midst of the uncertainty that we see, in the midst of rising COVID cases, in the midst of contentious elections, uh, Lord, you're still God. And we need to cry out to you, and we need to remember that. So, God, would you comfort and encourage us as we worship this day? Would you, uh, would you allow your Holy Spirit to move in and through our lives? Would you just be with us? We thank you that that is the promise of Isaiah, that you are Emmanuel, God with us, and that, God, we're not alone. So guide us and lead us this day as we worship you. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, La Jolla Presbyterian Church. We want to welcome you to our online service this morning. Wherever you may be, let us worship and praise the Lord together. Oh, that you love me. 
Good morning, church. We are so excited for you to be here once again with us online and in person. We have a couple announcements for you and we're just excited. I say excited a lot because I truly am excited. Uh, I, I can't tell you how much I've missed church and how much I've needed community. And I can't tell you that how much I experience it, even if we just are online. So when you're ready to come back, we want you here. First, thank you for those who donated food on Saturday. Holy moly, we can't tell you the gratitude we have for you and for everything that this church gives to feed those in need. It's an amazing experience that this church gets to take part in. And so we are so excited that you as our church, as the church as a whole, as Christ's body, is willing to take up that cross and carry it. So thank you. Next. If you feel comfortable and you want to come to in-person church, we need one thing from you. We need an RSVP. Crazy enough, we are hitting higher and higher numbers with that, and we want you to be able to be there. So don't take the risk and just walk up. We need you to RSVP. Go online, ljpress.org, and you can RSVP to be there. Watch me on stage. Watch Paul on stage. Watch everyone on stage. We want you there. It's an amazing experience. Next, on November 6th, from 6 to 7.30, we have a women's worship night. Oh my gosh, we are so excited for that because this is a moment where we get to do what the church does best. We get to sing worship to who Jesus is. It's outside. We have an amazing worship, worship team. We have bonfires going. It will just be an experience you don't want to miss. If you want more information, reach out to Cynthia. She's planning this, and we know it's going to be great. She does great things when it comes to women's ministry, and so this is going to be another amazing experience. Next, on November 12th, we have this kind of combination experience where Monarch Cottage, the place that helps with uh, elderly people and they are helping with mental illness, is hosting this panel over Zoom. And Scott Mitchell gets to be a part of that and he is speaking. And if you want to be a part of that and if you want to get more information on that, it's on mental health and wellness. Reach out to Scott Mitchell. He's got all the information for you. We would love, love, love if you would be a part of that. Nothing more important than during this time of separation and isolation to figure out how we can pour back into people, how we can get new tools for our tool belt when we want to help and talk to people. Lastly, we have an amazing video coming up. It's actually kind of heart-wrenching, but it's important. It's the persecuted church by the company Voice of the Martyrs. I think you will enjoy it if you get into the mindset that we are not it. This is not the whole body of Christ in this room right now. This is not the whole body of Christ in this church. There are people all over the world being persecuted for their beliefs. And so this video will give us a little bit of insight into what's happening all over the world who, for people that call themselves Christians. My name is Jeanette. I am a Christian and I love Jesus with all my heart. I love my children and I love the people of my country the Central African Republic. There are both Christians and Muslims in my country, and we lived as neighbors as I worked to reach them for Christ. But my hope for a peaceful life didn't last. Our village was ambushed by the Islamist attackers. Guns started firing, and we started running as fast as we could into the bush. All the Christians in my village were killed or driven into hiding. I fled with my children. We didn't even have time to put on our shoes or clothes. Attacks like these have been targeting Christians in the Central African Republic for eight years and continue today. Churches and missionary stations that have been built over decades have been destroyed along with Christians' homes that have been burnt to the ground. In one area, the only structures that remained were the metal roofs of two churches. Thousands of Christians have spent years in makeshift temporary shelters far from their homes as the violence and instability continues. Delivering desperately needed help to displaced Christians often means overcoming impassable roads, using cargo planes, trucks, motorcycles, bicycles, and even canoes. With God's help, supplies are making it to Christians scattered throughout various camps. 
Today, Jeanette and more than 30,000 Christians in the Central African Republic have been driven from their homes, all because of their faithfulness in maintaining a witness for Christ in majority Muslim areas in the face of severe Islamist violence. These courageous believers, our Christian brothers and sisters in the Central African Republic, have shown God's love and forgiveness to their persecutors. They continue to faithfully follow the Lord and trust Him to meet their needs. Father, thank you for who you are. First and foremost, you are a good God. Regardless of what happens in our lives, regardless of the things that we think are your fault, you are a good God. And we love you for that. And we thank you because even when we don't deserve it, your goodness and your faithfulness still shows. Father, we pray over the fires that are happening in Irvine that are just ravaging homes and, and acreage of land, that you would be present that your supernatural forces would stop this fire in its tracks, that you would be with those that are fighting the fire, that you would be with those that are evacuating, that you would just be with the entire county of Orange County, that they would have the resources and the know-how in order to beat this fire. Father, we pray over the persecuted church all over the world. We know that in persecution, you still rise to the top. Your message still explodes. So, Father, in the midst of the pain that is happening, in the midst of terrorist organizations that are attacking, in the midst of all those problems, we pray that your message still has an explosive tendency, that your love and mercy and grace just pours out over all over the world, over those places where it's so illegal to be Christians or over those places where you're killed for that. Father, be there. Father, also, we pray over our lives that you start to shape our hearts and our minds and start to help us understand that there is a world that is bigger than this. That even though we're not persecuted in America or any type of persecution for our faith, that you would still help us to understand what it's like to be a Christian abroad and that you would break our hearts for what breaks yours. Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you've done in and through us and we pray over everyone watching this video and we pray over those that couldn't make it to the video and we pray over this church that we become your vessel more and more. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning, friends. Do you know what I have right here? Well, this is a set of rules for a new game I'm learning called Upwards. It looks like there are about 11 basic rules, but there's a lot to each one of them. I'll have to make sure I read this carefully, especially if I want to teach someone to play with me. Have you ever played a game with someone and you both thought you knew the rules, but your rules turned out to be different than their rules? And then, when you look them up, you find out that the real rules are even different. Rules can be confusing, but they're pretty important so that we know we're playing the game correctly. Now, this isn't a new problem. Back in Jesus' day, people talked about God's rules a lot. You know, the Ten Commandments. Well, some people who really liked rules, called the Pharisees, decided that ten was not enough. So they made up over 600 more. There were so many that one day they decided to ask Jesus which of all the rules was the most important. They were trying to stump him. But Jesus wasn't going to fall for that trap. He had the perfect answer. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. 
This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. He narrowed down the commandments to just two key things. Love God and love others. Jesus said that the number one rule was to love God, God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That means that everything that we do, think, or say should be done with God in mind because He's the most important. Jesus also said, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. That isn't just the person who lives next door, but all of the people we come in contact with. Jesus said that when we do those things, love God and love our neighbor, everything else comes into place. The other laws all hang on love. If we truly love God first and foremost, then we'll want to follow his other commands too. Now, this isn't always easy, of course. Sometimes people are hard to love. When others say unkind things or argue, we might want to be rude back at them. When rules seem unfair, we might want to break them or disrespect the people who made them. We might even grow frustrated following God's laws because we're not able to keep them perfectly. But the good news is, that we know Jesus perfectly kept the law on our behalf and he died for us to show God's love. Because of that, we can share his love with those around us no matter what they might do to us. And when we mess up, and we will, we can rest knowing that God will forgive us. All of this might seem impossible and on our own, it is. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit, to give us His power to do what's right, so that God will get the glory and not us. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for giving us laws so that we can live the lives that you have designed for us. God, would you remind us to call on the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can follow them as best we can so that you get the glory, God, and not us. Help us to love our neighbors and to love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this past Tuesday evening, Shannon and Morgan and I sat down at our dinner table and began the voting process. We actually had texted our son Micah to see if he wanted to join us via FaceTime, but he was teaching a Bible study, and so he said he wasn't going to be able to join us. And we sat at the dinner table, and we've, we've never really done this before in the family, because typically our kids have been away at college when uh, voting times have happened. And, and, and so we got out our ballots and our little I voted stickers and got out the laptops and got out the voting information that was sent to us, the voter guides. I had some opinions of people that I respect to, to kind of look through that information as well. And we sat down and we began that process of voting. And, and what a great privilege that is that we have, that regardless of, of who you're voting for or how you're voting, that we live in a nation where we actually have the ability to vote, to have our voice heard. And so, but as we went through this ballot, and as you know, it was, I, I think every, each one of us at a different time said, couldn't it just be more simple? Like the wording that is used, and the language that is used, and you read one thing, you think you've got it figured out, and you keep reading, you're like, well, I'm not so sure I have this figured out, and the people, and the names, and the propositions, and, and trying to work our way through that. There's so many words. Couldn't it just be a little more simple? But we know the case of that. There, there are a lot of words. And in our world and in our society, we hear a lot of words. And when I preach, I use a lot of words. And some of you probably think, well, Paul, maybe a few less words might be a little bit better. But there is something about the words that we use. But there's also something to this point of being simple. I remember one of the dear saints of our church who has now uh, gone to be with Jesus, she would say to me, Paul, just keep it simple. Remind people that Jesus loves them and that Jesus wants for us to love others. And, and it was such a great reminder for me because sometimes I think as pastors, 
and his theologians and his study people who lead studies in the church we can make the gospel super complicated but jesus had a great way of keeping it simple that we're going to read about in just a moment we're in this sermon series for this fall talking about finding our way and looking at the path of discipleship we spent the first three weeks of that talking about what does it look like to follow jesus in the last three weeks, we've talked about what it to look like to become like Jesus. And for the final three weeks of this series, I want to talk about what does it look to act like Jesus? We don't just admire Jesus. We don't just follow Jesus. We don't just become like Jesus. We also need to behave like Jesus. So what does Jesus have to say to us about our behavior, about how we act as the Son of God acted? And in our text this morning, Jesus is going to make it very clear of what it looks like to be a follower of his, of how we ought to model and shape our lives. Our text comes from Matthew chapter 22. It's a conversation with the Pharisees and Jesus. And as you know, this story, oftentimes the Pharisees and Sadducees are trying to trip Jesus up by asking him questions where they think he's going to say something or do something that will put him in a, in a vulnerable position. And as we know, Jesus never does that. But Matthew 22 is interesting because the religious leaders are asking a lot of questions. And as you look through this, the whole uh, chapter of Matthew 22, you see that. You see that, the, first of all, the, the Pharisees send their disciples to ask Jesus a question. Jesus deals with that. Then the Sadducees go to Jesus and ask a question, and he deals with that. And then this morning in our text, we're at Matthew 22. We're going to be reading verses 34 through 40. And here come the Pharisees. We read, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? He's looking for one. He's looking to narrow down the list. He's looking for what kind of commandment is the most important. They're looking to trip Jesus up. And Jesus does something fascinating because we've talked about this before. If you look in the Old Testament, there are 16, 613 laws including the Ten Commandments. So you have the 613, you have the ten that are much more specific. And, and, and what the people of Israel would have thought of is that each of these laws would have hung on like a peg. It would have been a strand hanging from a peg, and each one of those pegs would have been linked to a certain scripture. And so there'd be 613 of these strands all the way across, and they were picking and choosing and wanting to know which of the 613 were the most important. And Jesus says, nope, you got it all wrong. There are only two pegs. Love the Lord your God with everything that you have and love your neighbor as yourself. And from those two pegs hangs one cord and everything hangs on that. You see, Jesus wasn't concerned about the 613. He wasn't concerned about the 610. He knew they were important. He wanted us to follow them. But he says, let me make it simple for you. You are to love God, and you are to love your neighbor. If you want to act like me, this is what it's all about. The love of God comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. This is what we read there. Deuteronomy says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And a faithful Jewish person, would have prayed this. This was a part of the Shema. Here, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God. A faithful Jew would have prayed this every morning and every evening because they knew that their calling was to look to God as they began their day and as they ended their day, to face Godward, to look up to the heavens, to call out on this God who had redeemed them. This was the story of Israel. God who had brought them out of darkness and into light. This was the God who loved them. This was the God who redeemed them. This was the God who was personal 
And so Israel's calling morning and evening was to look to that God and remind themselves, I am to love God with everything that I have. And Jesus said, this is where it begins. But he said, there's also this second commandment. And everything he says is going to hang on these two things. The second one comes out of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. We read, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Leviticus, in the midst of a whole bunch of different rules and regulations that it has, says you need to love your neighbor as yourself. And God ends that by saying, I am the Lord. So our calling then, Jesus says, there's just two things you need to worry about. You need to love God, and you need to love your neighbor. I love how Dale Bruner puts it in his commentary on Matthew. He says, love the, love the God who loves you, and cherish the person who needs you. Love the God who loves you, and cherish the person who needs you. Look up to God. But as you look out and make your way through life, cherish those you encounter. So I want to talk about a little bit then, what, what, is, what does it look like to love God? What does that tangibly look like? Because I think this idea of loving God is one that we, we can all say we love God, but what, how do we tangibly make that happen? And, and, and I think it takes devotion. I think it takes time. Any relationship that is going to work, you all know this, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes energy. That to love God, we have to be devoted to God. I think there's a sense that, that in loving God, we take everything that is so vitally important to us, our dreams, our hopes, our aspirations, and we take those to God and we place those in front of God. And we say, God, do with those what you will, but ultimately what we want, ultimately what I want, God, is your joy and your satisfaction. I want the peace that surpasses all understanding that the Apostle Paul talks about that, that talk, the Apostle Paul talks about in Philippians. But folks, that's, a, that, that's hard. And if you were to go back and you were to look at my journals from the last 15 years or so, you would see that on a fairly regular basis, that's what I'm journaling. A part of every one of those journals is saying, Lord, let me be more like you. Let me know your joy, your peace, your satisfaction. Let me take my hopes, my dreams, my aspirations, and place them at your feet, God. And let you do with them what you will. I think that gets us to this place where we are loving God with everything that we have because we're offering God everything that we have. And that takes devotion, and that takes time. And it's not just something that we do in a rote sort of fashion. We have to actually be intentional about going to God and sharing those things with God, saying, God, I want to serve you. Jesus, Jesus gives us this great image in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, where he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The world has a way of making us weary. The world has a way at times of, of weighing down on us, of, of becoming like a burden. And Jesus says, if you come to me, I'll give you rest. I'll give you shalom. I'll give you peace. And I think Jesus recognizes the importance of that relationship with God the Father. Because Jesus had that. How many times does Jesus go out and pray? We're actually going to be talking about the prayer life of Jesus next week because I do think that prayer is a huge part of this idea of becoming like Jesus and then living and behaving like Jesus. But Jesus would, would pray and would ask God, and he had this incredible relationship with God that was based on devotion through love. So Jesus says, love God with everything that you've got. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Now this is kind of interesting because you would think he would just say love your neighbor or the Leviticus would have just said love your neighbor but they include this phrase love your neighbor as yourself. And so what, is, what does that mean? What does that, again tangibly, 
We, we, we can say we need to love God, we need to love our neighbor, and everything hangs on that. But tangibly, what does that look like for you and for me? And I think it's saying that, that we need to think about the things that we love. What, what, what are you passionate about? Like maybe you're passionate about cooking and you love to cook. Well, then maybe what you need to do is figure out how about your neighbors? So how about the poor and the impoverished? How about those who don't have a food who don't have food to eat? How can you help with them? Maybe you're a person who feels as though you know you have dealt with a lot of injustice in your life and you have worked to to, to right the wrongs in your own life. But maybe that means that if you're going to love your neighbor as you love yourself, that you're going to work for the justice of those who are poor, of those who are oppressed. Maybe you love your family. I mean, we all love our family, but maybe that's where your passion is. And what you need to do is say, well, what other families do I encounter who need to be loved, who need to be encouraged? God, open my eyes to those sorts of things. I think what Jesus is getting at by going back to Leviticus and then by saying you need to love your neighbor as you love yourself, is that, that we do love ourselves. We do love certain things about ourselves. We are passionate about certain things. And Jesus is saying, take some of that passion and use it for the sake of others. Don't hold on to your gifts just for yourself and your family. But share those with one another. That's one of the ways we love our neighbors. We keep an eye out for them. We take that which we are passionate about, we love to do, and we use that for the sake of others. I think there's another way that we have to be mindful of how we love and care for our neighbors, and particularly for those who are on the margins. You may recall in, in Luke chapter 10, a very similar story happens to the one we just read about in Matthew 22. A, a teacher of the law goes up to Jesus and asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what does the law say? Now, this teacher of the law must have been present for the conversation in Matthew 22 because he answers correctly. He says, I need to love God, and I need to love my neighbor. And then he tries to justify himself, and so he says to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Because Jesus has said, hey, you've answered well. And the man just keeps pushing, like the Pharisees kept pushing Jesus. And he says, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus then in Luke 10 goes on to tell the story of the Good Samaritan. And you all may recall this story because what Jesus is doing is instead of answering the question of who my neighbor is, he's saying, I'm going to show you what it looks like to be a good neighbor. I'm going to show you what it looks like to actually love your neighbor, not necessarily worry about who your neighbor is. So a man is the story in Luke chapter 10 that Jesus tells. A man's heading down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And on the way down, he is beat up. He is robbed. He is has everything taken from him, and he is left on the side of the road, left for dead. A priest walks by, a religious leader, a Levite, another religious leader, a priest and a Levite both walk by the man on the side of the road, and they choose not to help him, because if they go over to him, and if he is dead, or if he is not Jewish, they will become unclean. They had all just gone to the temple. They're coming back down the road from Jerusalem, into Jericho, it's a winding road, high, it makes a high elevation climb, it's 17 miles long, it, it, it's, a, it's a considerable road, and they look at the man on the side of the road and they say, we can't help him. It's too much of a risk. These people who had just gone to church, who had just heard the word of God proclaimed, and they walk right by someone in need. But the Samaritan thinks differently. He doesn't think about what's going to happen to him, like the religious leader and the Levite did. He thinks instead, what will happen to the man on the side of the road if I don't help him? What else might happen to him? And as we know, in the day and age of Jesus, Samaritans were not treated well. They were outsiders. They were outcasts. They themselves would have been seen as unclean. They were not of the, of the Jewish tribe. They were not 100% Jewish. And so they were disdained and looked down upon. And yet it is this Samaritan who shows us what love is all about. This outsider who walks over and says, I realize that if I don't help this man on the side of the road, if I don't show him love, if I don't love him as a neighbor, then, then no one else is going to help. And he goes over and he binds up his wounds and he puts him on his animal and he takes him to an inn and he says to the innkeeper, just take care of this man until he is able to, to get well and then I will come and pay the bill. I'll take care of all the costs. So that's another way of being a neighbor. It's keeping our eyes open. 
But there's a bigger dilemma on the Jericho Road between Jerusalem and Jericho. And that is when Jesus told that story, everybody could imagine someone getting beat up on that road. Because it was known for that. It was basically deserts on both sides and uh, these bandits would come and, and they would rob people. They would steal from people. They would hide out and wait for people to come to a certain point on the road. And they would jump out, take everything from them, and leave them on the ground with absolutely nothing. And the question that needs to be asked, that doesn't get asked, but it needs to be addressed by us as we think about loving our neighbor, is why was that road always filled with bandits? Why didn't somebody do something about making that road a safer place? Why didn't they do something about the structures that had been set up or not set up? So what I'm saying here, though, and trying to get across is saying, we need to look at places in our society where people keep getting beat up. What structures do we have in place that hold people back? What internal biases do we have that push people away? Who are the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, who never seem to get a fair shake at life? Who perhaps have not been blessed like we've been blessed, who have not been raised like we have been raised. What places in our society are the marginalized continually being marginalized? Where do people keep walking down the road and getting beat up? And what can we do about that? Because I am convinced that that is also a part of loving our neighbor, of looking around and seeing where systems are not working. And what can we do on a local level? We spend a lot of time talking about the national level and who's going to be our next president. I mean, we're in the midst of that right now, and people are voting and, and all that sort of stuff. But we need to be looking at a local level, too, saying what systems and structures need to be changed for the sake of others. And there's this idea of what I am who I am as a person, it, it, it's going to be hard for me to love my neighbor if I'm not loving God. If I'm not prioritizing God in my life, it's going to be a struggle to love my neighbor well. Because what I am determines how I'm going to behave. It's this whole idea of the path of discipleship with Jesus. We follow, we become, and then we act. Again, back to Dale Bruner's quote. Love the, God, love the God who loves you and cherish the person who meets you. This is election week. And many of us have probably already voted. But it's going to be a rough week for people. Let's face it. Someone's going to win and someone is going to lose. But the greatest thing, I believe, that we can do as followers of Jesus is to love one another well, to speak with grace and truth and peace. The world needs to see the church loving. The world needs to see the, and know that the church is for people. We're not against everything. 1 John 4, 7, or 1 John 4, 12 puts it like this. And I think that this verse really, really helps me in thinking about how I want to live. John says, No one has ever seen God, but... If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. I think what that text is saying is that it's hard to see God. We know that. But it's easy to see people who follow Jesus. And if we will love, as God has called us to love, People will see God. They will come to know God. So my prayer, my hope for us this week, this week of elections, of voting, is that we will love well. We'll love God with everything we've got, and we'll love our neighbor as ourselves. And coming to this table, I want to say one more thing. 
one more word of hope, because last week you may recall, I said it begins with grace and it ends with grace, which I totally believe. I want to talk about how sometimes we're the ones in the ditch. We're the ones who feel beat up. We're the ones who don't have the strength to get up and keep moving. And that's when Jesus shows up. You see, Jesus was not unlike the Samaritan in our story. He was despised. He was forsaken. He was rejected. He was seen as an outsider. And yet, out of his great love, he kept walking up to people who were marginalized. He kept walking up to people who were beaten up and laying in a ditch. He kept walking up to the least of these and saying, I have a word of hope. I have come to give you life and to give you an abundance of life. And so this morning at this table, we are reminded of that, that Jesus Christ has come for us, that Jesus Christ has paid the price for us, and that one day he will return and make all things right. And so in that meantime, we wait, but we wait expectantly and we wait with hope. Pray with me, please. God, thank you for this table that we now come to. Thank you, God, for the, the rich teaching of Jesus where he says, love God with everything you have because God has loved you and love your neighbor like you love yourself and use your passion and your gifts for the sake of your neighbor. Lord, help us to see those in need this week. Remind us, of oh God, of your great love for us. And if we find ourselves in the ditch on the side of the road feeling beat up, give us your hope, Lord Jesus. Beat us, we pray and ask. God, we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. So this morning we gather around this table, we gather around the tables where you are, and we remember what God has done for us in and through Jesus Christ. We recall that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God in heaven, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And in the same manner, after dinner, Jesus took the cup. And he said, This cup is the new covenant which is sealed in my blood. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so the church has remembered that as often as we eat this bread, we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death, until he returns again. Let us now share in the breaking of the bread, sharing of the cup. Let us partake of the Lord's Son.
And so every Sunday, as we conclude our worship service when we have communion, we do so using the Apostles' Creed, reminding ourselves of how God comes to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So let us affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven. He is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now as we go forth, Receive our Lord's blessing as you go. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all both now and forevermore.